Fazit. Und so. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about uh, magnetic monopoles and um, and differential forms, and um, then on Wednesday I'll talk about magnetic uh, mag magnetic monopoles as solitons. Well, sort of solitons. Depends on uh, depending on what you uh, what you mean by a soliton. I think of a soliton as a finite energy field configuration, um, one in which the energy is a minimum of the of the energy density or a solution of the classical field equations that has finite energy and is typically the energy is bounded in space. Okay, so the, the stuff on differential forms, I, I'm, I'm a little, I was hoping some other people would be here because I'm a little worried that the three of you already know everything I'm about to say. Um, you shouldn't be too worried about that. Huh? You shouldn't be too worried. Well, all right. So let me, this, so a one form is something like this, a mu d a mu. And um, suppose we have a coordinate transformation, x prime is x prime of x, or equivalently x is x of x prime. Then uh, dx mu, of course, is going to be partial x mu, partial x prime nu, dx prime nu. And so this is a mu partial x mu partial x prime nu dx prime nu, which tells us that this is also equal to a prime, which is a prime nu dx prime nu, as long as a prime nu is equal to a mu partial x mu. So in other words, forms, one of the nice things about this in, in this notation that was introduced by Ailey Cartan probably about a hundred years ago is that um, it's just very, very slick. Um, it's, it just gives you the right, automatically the right transformation laws, all sorts of other cute things. All right, so, um, Notice that the forms are invariant. That's one of the nice things about these things. The form is automatically invariant under coordinate transformations. Um, so an example of a, of a, of a one form is A equal to, for example, cosine theta d phi. This one has A theta is zero and a phi is cosine theta. So that's just an example of a simple one. P form cost is something like H is one over conventionally one over P factorial, and then H mu one up to mu P dx mu one dx mu p. I'm um, following uh, Z's um, uh, notation, which is to drop the uh, wedge. But I mean, the wedge is there. It's just that we're not going to write. I'm not going to be writing it because it seems like an extra, an extra, um, just an just extra clutter. So a function m of x is a zero form. And um, f, a two form could be 1 over 2, f mu nu, dx mu, dx nu. Now, these differentials anti commute. And in order to see why, let's, cons let's, let's realize that we want the differentials, first of all, to transform properly. And in fact, um, we want this to be an element of area. So under a trend, let's just consider dx and dy so we don't have the superscripts. Then dx dy is partial x, partial x prime, the 
x prime plus partial x partial y dy prime times partial y partial x prime dx prime plus partial y partial y prime dy prime. So you said implicitly that you're, you have wedge products between all the basis vectors? Right, there are actually wedges here, but another way of saying it is that these differentials just anti-commute to these things. Are That's not necessary. I mean, can, can a two-form just be a tensor product between two differentials? I mean, the wedge product has a special meaning that it's this anti-symmetric combination of tensor products. Well, you can't have a two-form without being anti-symmetric. It, it, it's, it's it's the easy. issue is whether it's a whether it's a p form or just I mean you can construct these things you're so talking would, about that would just be the dual vector space. You can talk it about the be a form. Yeah, forms have to be anti-symmetric. That's right. Is that right? right. You form a two form. By the Today the forms are anti-symmetric. If you want to talk on Wednesday, that's fine about symmetrical. Today they're anti-symmetric. Okay. All right, let me just bring you up to date. Um, a function is a zero form. Something like this, a mu dx mu, one form. dx mu transforms this way. So automatically, the form's invariant as long as the, 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 the thing that's not the differential transforms appropriately as a tensor, or here as a vector. There's an example. Here's a p-form. We have all these d, these differentials, and then we have an h and one over p factor. An example is f mu nu. And now I'm saying why it is that these things have to be Grassmann or anti-commuting. And the reason is that if we multiply this out, we see if they are Grassmann, then dx prime squared is 0 dy prime squared is zero, just because dx prime, dx prime is the same thing as minus dx prime and dx prime, which is zero. And then this thing gives you dx dy equals <coughs> partial x, partial x prime times partial y, partial y prime, dx prime, dy prime, and then plus partial x, partial y, partial y, partial x prime, this prime I left out, dy prime, dx prime, and we rewrite that as partial x, partial x prime, partial y, partial y prime, minus partial x, partial y prime, partial y, partial x prime, dx prime, dy prime. So if you make them anti-commuting, they become elements of area. And in fact, remember that if you have two little vectors like this, think about this as dx and this as dy in three space, then the area is the cross product of dx with dy. A, it's a vector, and B, it's, it's a vector pointing up this way the magnitude of the vector is the area of the parallelogram. But if you did it the other way, dy dx would be going down. Okay? So it's that anti symmetric the anti-symmetric structure is intrinsic to area. Um, and so this is then the Jacobian xy semicolon x prime y prime dx prime dy prime. So that's, that's that remarkable thing about these, um, about these differential forms. They're just so, so cute. Um, in particular, it means that this f mu nu has to be anti-symmetric because it's multiplying something that's anti-symmetric. If this was symmetric, it would disappear. Um, actually, I only would I am running out of candies, though, so I have I can reward four more questions. Are they, are they all Nestle Crunch? Boom! That's a question. <laughs> all right, I'm only going to reward math questions. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, These are physics questions. Um, that. No, they're not all, but there are three crunches. Oh. <laughs> this is crunch. I will, I will buy some more next time I go to Costco. All right, so FU nu is anti-symmetric. And these p-forms are invariant. And in particular, we find how F, F mu nu transforms um, <coughs> prime lambda sigma, I'm skipping something in my notes. It's x mu comma lambda prime x mu comma sigma prime minus x mu comma sigma prime x mu comma lambda prime f mu nu. So that's how this thing transforms. Okay, so now we're going to define d. This is one, another one of the cute things about differential forms. First of all, d on a zero form just gives us a one form. Partial f, partial x mu, d x mu. And let me use this notation, f comma mu, d x mu. That just makes it, saves us a little bit of writing. So, what about dA? Well, dA is d on, say, a mu dx mu. And so this is a mu comma nu dx nu dx mu. And this, it turns out, is the same thing as f. In other words, this thing over here. OK, so these, this notation is, is, is very, very cute. Um, on a p-form, H, D does this. It's 1 over P factorial H um, U1 dot 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 U P comma nu DX nu DX mu 1 DX mu P. So as I said before, um, Finley would write this as a half f mu nu dx mu wedge dx nu. We're just leaving out the wedges. OK, notice that d a <coughs> is a p plus 1 form. So d takes you to a higher form, higher level. All right, one of the important rules is that dd, or d squared, is just identically zero. The way to see that, really, I'm going to skip some of this. The way to see that is that dd, well, first of all, what is d? d, of course, is dx nu. D by dx nu. So dd is d on dx nu, let us just call it d nu. And this thing is going to be then dx mu dx nu d mu d nu. Okay? And the thing is that this is symmetric and this is anti-symmetric, so it's zero. d squared is 0. Um, maybe I shouldn't have skipped that completely. Let me bring it back. What is df? Well, we've already seen that f is dA. So df has to be just 0. But um, what is df? Well, df is a half f mu nu comma sigma dx sigma dx nu dx nu. And looking at it like that, it's not obvious that it's zero. But when you, realize, when you write it the other way as dA and A as A mu comma nu dx nu dx mu, now we see this, this is the following. It's A 
mu comma nu sigma dx sigma dx nu dx mu. This is anti-symmetric in sigma and nu. This is clearly symmetric in sigma and nu. This being partial with respect to x nu, partial, double partial with respect to x nu and x sigma. Okay. So this thing is um, And th this thing is written in various ways. This expression is the same thing as 0 equals epsilon u nu lambda sigma f uh, mu nu comma lambda, say. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can write it differently. Anyway, this is... How can we have one side with a free index and one side without a free index? Yeah, so this is four equations. Mm -hmm. One for each sigma. And you sum all of your new lambda. And there's a comment here, of course. Okay. The, these four equations are the two homogeneous Maxwell equations. Okay, some more lingo. I think actually I'm going to get through this lecture faster than I thought. We're like 11 pages of notes, but we're already on page five, and we haven't even what? Uh, please stop. What? Uh, five seems like a lot. This doesn't doesn't seem like five so far. Five. Maybe I've been going too fast. Okay, P form. How does varying sigma get you different equations? There? Excuse me. I'm, I just I'm not clear on how varying sigma there gets you four different equations, seeing that uh, the part on sigma the one. So that's sigma equals zero. That's one equation. Yeah. Yeah. Sigma <laughs> equals one. Yeah, I'm just, I just get that. I get that. It's just, um, In other words, this is zero for each sigma. Right. So there are four equations. Now. Oh, I should have right, what are the four right. equations? L dot B is zero. And the other one is that I unfortunately don't have memorized Maxwell equation. This. But um, it's what? The curl, curl of B. Huh? Curl B. Curl B. Plus or minus B dot equals zero. Yeah, that sounds right. Well, I'm not sure if you get uh, that from you do. the homogeneous one. Well, th those are homogeneous. Right. I mean, this, this, there are two equations that look very much like this. One of them has a J in it and one doesn't. I'm talking about the one that doesn't have a J. So is there... I think that's right. And again, it's in that this is true in some system of units. Okay, so a P form is closed if a P form alpha is closed if D alpha is zero. A P form is exact if alpha is equal to d beta, where beta is some p plus 1 form. Minus 1, p minus 1. Hmm? p minus 1? No, I think. You go yeah. up. Yeah, 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 you're right, p minus 1. OK, somebody gets a candy. So who went? Who? He was about a second. And you can have it. Ooh, ooh. Oh, it's the non-crunch. I think I was earlier. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Bullshit. That ruins questions for the rest of the day. All right. So, closed means d alpha is zero. Exact means there's a p minus one form such that alpha is d beta. All right. Now, Poincaré got into. Oh, first, first, first. Let's notice something. Every exact form.
that is to say exact means alpha equals d beta, is closed, that is to say d alpha equals d d beta is zero. Okay. Well, obviously every exact form is closed because d on an exact form is d d on some other form and d squared is zero. Now Poincaré's lemma um, is, uh, is, is the opposite one, is the opposite basically. It says that a closed form, that is to say d alpha equals zero, is locally exact. That is, alpha equals d beta locally. And if we pop down to three dimensions, we're, we've been working here in n dimensions. Um, things are clearer in three dimensions because that's where we live, at least in three space dimensions these three big space dimensions. Um, we can imagine that if the curl of f is equal to zero, that is to say f is closed, then f is equal to minus the gradient of something else, f is exact. But remember how this works. It works that as long as you're in a region in which, uh, in, in, in a superconnected region, or equivalently, if, it's, if F is closed, then it's locally exact. So for example, um, if you have a hole in your region, then the fact that the curl of F is zero everywhere here doesn't guarantee that you have a um, potential that uh, works. In fact, um, you might say that F might be, um, F as a vector might be some F of uh, R D P. And um, so this guy would have, I, 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 I'm, I'm making this up, this example up on the fly, but um, something like this would have curl of f equals zero, but um, or have I gotten it backwards? Wouldn't that be all curl? Yeah, that's what I think I've done. All right. Forget the example. Well, we're familiar that if the curl of f is zero, we can find a potential, but if there are holes, we're in trouble. And so let me, let me not try to, to, to go beyond that. Let me just show you, though, how this works in the, in the lingo of differential forms in three dimensions. f is the one form here. It's fi dxi. So this is the force. Curl F equals zero is DF equals zero. DF is FI comma J DXI DXJ equals zero. And um, when is that zero? Well, that's if FI comma J um, is symmetric. In other words, if partial fi, partial xj equals partial fj, partial xi, and that says the curl is zero. All right. So if the curl is zero, or equivalently, if df is zero, then then there exists a. Uh, this is a one form. It's just a zero form minus v such that f is equal to d 
of minus v, which is minus v comma i d x i. All right, and which is to say f is, is equal to minus grad v. All right, so as I was saying, these, this notation of differential forms is very, very slick. Um, Notice that in the case of f, a half f mu nu d x mu d x nu, the element of area here is part of the two forms. And so you can say we're integrating f about the boundary of some three, f oh, I'm sorry, boundary of some three manifold, well, this thing is just integral of a half f mu nu dx mu dx nu. So this, the differentials are already there. You can just, you just write it this way because you've already got the differentials. Now, there's a famous theorem which we use in physics in various forms, namely m dA is integral A dM. So you have here a P form. And the P minus 1 form here. Wait a minute. I'm going the wrong way, right? This is mm -hmm. P plus 1 form. OK, a P plus 1 form uh, dA. And um, M is a P plus 1 dimensional manifold, so that makes more sense. And DM, then, is a P manifold, because it's the boundary of a P plus 1 manifold. So the integral of a P plus 1 form DA over a manifold, a P plus 1 dimensional manifold, is equal to the integral of the p-form a over the boundary of the um, p manifold over the p-dimensional manifold, which is the boundary of the p plus one dimensional manifold. Okay. Let me give an example of that. In fact, the example is one that you've seen a million times. One form A equals A mu dx mu. Then integral A over the boundary is integral A mu dx mu over the boundary is equal to the integral of dA over M, which is the integral of F. And if we drop down to three dimensions, this becomes clearer because this thing, integral dm of a, this is an integral of a uh, i dx i over the boundary. And this is the same thing as the integral of b, the magnetic field, dot d sigma over the surface. So we're the, integral, the line integral of A around the around dm is equal to the integral of B around M. And this is something of course you've seen a zillion times. Okay, now um, I want now to go switch now to magnetic monopoles. And um, the, the first thing is that these were, I guess the first person to, well, it turns out, I didn't know this until I was reading uh, today, uh, it turns out that Maxwell was very uh, aware of the symmetry between E and B and between 
electric charge or magnetic charge in, my, in his equations. And he speculated on the existence of magnetic monopoles. Um, Dirac then introduced a quantization condition. And um, it's quite interesting. So let's, let's just look at something uh, now. Okay. Consider F to be G over 4 pi D cosine theta D phi. All right, you integrate F over the two sphere, in other words, the surface of an ordinary sphere. This is G over 4 pi integral D cos theta D phi, and this just gives you G. On the other hand, we've already seen that the integral of F over the surface of a, uh, over the two sphere is the integral of F over the boundary of the three sphere, which would be the integral of DF over um, the three sphere itself, the volume of the three sphere. But DF in this case is zero. So we've got something puzzling here. In other words, df is 0 because this is, um, that would be g over 4 pi, and we would have d hitting uh, either d cosine of theta or d phi. And so two, I don't understand. The two sphere is not the boundary of a three sphere. No, but three it's the boundary part. I'm boundary. using S3 for the, the ball. Okay. Nice. Right. That makes sense. You're right. Yeah. All right, so this is bad notation. B3. B3. <laughs> B3. I'm happy with that. All right, um, I owe you a candy. If you, if you want one or no, okay. Yeah. You're good? Yeah. We're down on candy. We've got about three left. Two. Okay, so something funny is happening here. Um, this is uh, a form that, a two form that seems to give us just the right thing, but in fact, EF is zero. Um, and yet, integrating F, we seem to get the right charge, and so what's going on? Why, why is something funny happening here? Well, the answer is that, um, let's consider the corresponding A. Let it be G over 4 pi cosine theta d phi. So this is the one form that we talked about before. Now that gives you F as G over 4 pi d cosine theta d phi. So it seems as though F is in fact exact, of course that means it's closed, I've seen it's closed, but anyway. But, um, so this would seem to be okay, but the fact is this thing is undefined at north and south poles. Okay? Because, uh, Phi is undefined at north and south poles. Okay. Right. So, what Wu and Yang did was they said, well, let's do the following. Let's define an A, a one form in the north, which is G over 4 pi cosine theta minus 1 d phi. Now, at the North Pole, it doesn't matter that d phi is undefined because this is 0. And then they said, well, let's define a South as g over 4 pi cosine theta plus 1 d phi. And now, this is a one form that's OK in the south, but doesn't work at the North Pole. And so the idea that they had was to, this is the 
the sphere, you use a north here, and then you use a south here. And so you have an A everywhere. And then the question is, well, can we get away with this? How is that different from the fact that you need two coordinate charts to cover the sphere? Isn't it the same idea? It's absolutely the same idea. I'm not that impressed that they work then. Well, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an extra wrinkle here. Okay. You'll see. All right, what's the extra wrinkle? Well, the problem is that we have AS minus AN. Where they overlap, what is it? Well, it's G, 2G over 4 pi, D phi. And that's not zero. And so we've got, um, we, we, we may have a problem. The, the solution to the problem is to interpret this as a gauge transformation. Well, let's remember what a gauge transformation is. And we're in the case of U1. So it's mercifully simple. It's E to the I lambda of X, psi of X. And of course, the key thing which I emphasize is that the phase transformation of the blue group transformation depends upon the space time point. And moreover, A prime mu of X is A mu of X plus. 1 over i e, e to the minus i lambda of x, t u, e to the i lambda of x. Or equivalently, the one form, a prime, which is a prime mu dx mu, is a plus 1 over i e, e to the minus i lambda d e to the i lambda, where this is this different this, what the hell do you call that thing? Mm. What is it? It's, which one? What do we, uh, the, the, what, what do the mathematicians call the exterior derivative? Yes, mm -hmm. bravo, thank you. Exterior derivative. I should have said that. Okay, um, and of course this thing in fact is equal to a mu plus lambda comma mu over e so that's another way of writing a prime. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is just a review of what a gauge transformation is. Now the question is, can we rescue this situation by saying that, uh, oh, just don't, don't, let's see, who, uh, just don't, Cut off the electricity. All right. So the question is, can we arrange that AS minus AN be a gauge transformation? In other words, can this be one over I e e to the minus I lambda d e to the I lambda, or equivalently? We cancel the two, g over two pi d phi is equal to one over e lambda comma phi d phi. That would be the way we'd get it to do. We could get phi lambda just to depend upon phi, and then we see we have a possible candidate here. Lambda of phi is just egg over two pi times phi. And all right. But for sure, we need that e to the i phi, e to the i lambda, be single value. Because for example, that's how the field psi transforms. And um, so that means that e to the i 
p plus 2 pi should be e to the i lambda of phi. So that means e to the i eg over 2 pi e plus 2 pi has to be the same as e to the i eg over 2 pi phi. Okay. But that means that eg, or equivalently, e to the i eg has to be equal to 1. But that means that the eg has to be 2 pi n. So this is Dirac's quantization condition for the charge of the magnetic monopole, namely g is 2 pi an integer over e. Dirac got this from a totally different argument, but um, you get this, uh, the same result. Following the the laws of physics can be summarized in one sentence. Direct is always right. <laughs> um, now, let's get back to F. We saw that F um, is closed because DF is zero. But it's locally exact, not globally exact. So locally, F is D-A-N or D-A-S, but, not, but it's not D-anything globally. Okay. All right, so now I've got oh, some more things to say. Turns out that Maxwell's equations are invariant for a certain transformation. Let me use up this nice blackboard here. You can say E prime plus I B prime is E to the I theta E plus I B. So you can try that out. It turns out that that's a symmetry of them. Notice that E and B are dual, and the electric charge and the magnetic charge are dual in the following sense. You see that they're written as expressed by these two equations. In particular, in our world, E is fairly small, so G has to be big. And conversely, if, if E were big, then G would be small. And um, so in a sense, uh, this is an example of um, duality. And in, in duality, you basically have two different theories that are sort of related to each other. And so you could study how, how electrons behave interacting with each other at weak coupling. And that's the rule to how magnetic molecules behave with each other, but at strong coupling. Um, and somehow with this symmetry or something else one can infer from the perturbative solution of the electric case to the non-perturbative solution of the uh, magnetic case, although it's not apparently how it works. All right, let me go, go uh, hop to, a, to two different subjects. Um, one having to do with uh, currents. So the ordinary current associated with the world line of charge, it would be d tau dx dx mu d tau, and now however many dimensions we're in, delta D of X minus capital X four. So that's one way of writing the, the current. The current at X is effectively the the the, the X that you tore times the tore. This is paramet param 
is invariant under a change of parametrization, or a change of parameter, I should say. The time parameter? Tall. Yeah. In the, so this is the world line for a particle. If instead we're talking about a string, then you have this world of <coughs> tube, I guess, of a string. And what we have is, actually, let me rewrite this slightly. This can be thought of as an integral d capital X mu times delta d of x minus big X of four, just essentially canceling those two. Now, j mu nu of x for a string is d tau d sigma determinant of x mu comma tau, x mu comma sigma, x mu comma tau, comma meaning d by d tau cos, uh, x nu comma sigma. So this determinant times delta d of x minus big X of tau sigma. All right. Notice, however, that just going back to dx and dy over there, this is also uh, dx mu, dx nu delta d, x minus big X of Okay. This J mu nu is an anti-symmetric tensor. And um, so um, the coupling in electromagnetism is A mu J mu, where this is J mu. So in the case of a string, the coupling is B mu nu times J mu nu. So it's coupled to another to an anti-symmetric um, potential B mu nu. And that means that this uh, that there is a um, three form, which is dB, and um, that is the field. So, just as F is dA, the two forms here and the exterior derivative of the potential. So to here, the exterior derivative of the endosymmetric tensors is three form field for this uh, three form anti-symmetric field for this uh, string. Okay. Now the last topic is well, there are two last topics. One is in my notes. The other one I'll add later. Um, uh, the Aharonov Bohm effect. And um, one of the hardest things to understand about the Aharonov Bohm effect is how to spell Aharonov. Aharonov only has one A and it has two, no, it has two A's and two O's. So it's Aharonov. Bohm is just Bohm. All right, so the idea is you have some source sending out particles. You have some region where B is not equal to zero and you have a region B equals zero. Moreover, this region is basically shielded somehow. So you've got, I don't know, uh, metal some kind of around it so that, so that these particles can't get into the magnetic field. And then you have a, you have a detector over here. It's a theorist detector. Um, and these things can go around like this. And they can go around like this. And if the detector is here, then you get a signal. OK. So um, look at the phases. You can imagine this is trajectory one, this is trajectory two. Well, you know that the phase, if we take a path integral point of view, the phase associated with this amplitude is e to the i s1 and the phase of the other one is e to i s2. And if you think about the action for a point particle charge E, say, in an electromagnetic field, well, there are three terms. 
is an S that's something like minus integral square root, well, 1 minus v squared uh, dt, in fact. Uh, then there's another term, which is plus or minus e integral a mu dx mu. And then there's another term, which is plus or minus a quarter f mu nu, f mu nu, d4 of x. All right, so that's the total action for a, uh, or a single o charged particle in the electromagnetic field. And um, the part that I want to focus on here is this term. This one also contributes a phase, but I'm going to look at this part here. Is this here. the path length, or what is this first one? This first one is just detour. Oh, it's a okay. it's uh, minus the integral detour. So in, like, in regular quantum mechanics, that would be the dynamical phase you get from being an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And the other one is the geometric phase. Well, I will not deny what you're saying. <laughs> the first right. one's just the, the phase you get from evolution, yeah. from yeah. time evolution, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you guys may be right. I'm not. I'm not arguing right. with you. I'm just taking a pathological point of view. It's E to the I action. By the way, this thing here, just to, in the non-relativistic limit, this is just some constant plus. Uh, uh, a half m v squared dt integrated. All right. Oh, and so I left out an m. <laughs> okay. okay. So, what uh, is the difference in the phases? Difference in the phases is e to the i s1 minus s2, and then this. This is E to the I integral A mu dx mu. Okay. Now, um, in this experimental situation, we're talking about a time-independent electromagnetic field. And so this is simply E to the I integral A dot dx around the loop. And this is, an, oh, it's an E here. There's an E here, an E here. So this is E to the I E integral of that, and that of course is the integral of B dot uh, the surface, and this is E to the I E flux. So um, what you have then is a phase that is uh, that is very simple. It's just charge the electron times the magnetic flux coming through. And um, that was, when, when Aharonoff and Bohm published their theoretical paper, it caused quite a stir. A lot of people said, nah, who are these guys? Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a direct quote? And others, others, in fact, some important people, I like think Niels Bohr, was very distressed by their paper and thought it was certainly wrong. And then people did experiments and found out that they were right. And so after the experiments came in, um, people stopped saying, who are these guys? They're wrong. Um, let me um, get to one final thing, which is actually a uh, due to Sidney Coleman. Um, who was something of a practical joker as well as a um, theoretical physicist. And back when he was young, his hobby was magic. And that actually informed his lectures. Um, frankly, I'm not sure it was always a good thing, because although it was entertaining, um, he kind of rejoiced in being, in being able to say to the students, now you look over here. Meanwhile, he skipped the difficulty over here. And, um, well, maybe I'm being a little bit critical. But in any event, um, he had the following uh, 
a prank that he was thinking of. Suppose you t had a very thin solenoid and you um, created a magnetic field inside it. Okay. You made it really skinny and over a weekend at night you snuck it into some experimentalist laboratory. In particular, say somebody looking for magnetic monopoles. And you stuck this thing in so that it was right in the middle of the monopole detector. Well, you would come to the end here and there would be some flux coming out because this magnetic flux be coming through the solenoid. The question that Coleman asked, how would you arrange the solenoid so that the experimentalist would really think that uh, he or she had discovered a magnetic monopole? Well, what you'd do would be you'd arrange it so that you couldn't use the Harnoff bohm effect to detect uh, the solenoid. In other words, what you want was that the flux coming through would be um, such that it would satisfy, in other words, you want E phi. <coughs> to be 2 pi n. If E phi is 2 pi n, then you couldn't tell, you wouldn't get any phase by sending electrons around the thing. And what is uh, E phi? Well, it's the flux coming out here. And um, what, and, and so let me try to get back to this condition here. It's um, the flux is The flux would be the flux phi, of course, is obviously just two pi n over e, and um, that's of course g. So if the flux is in fact equal to the magnetic charge, the charge of the Dirac monopole, then they wouldn't see you wouldn't see any interference and. Um, the experimentalist would think but you'd, still see the, you'd still see the flux that looks like a it's coming from a point charge, I guess. So right, it would look like flux coming from a point charge if you made the thing infinitely thin and you could never tell that the solenoid was there. And this was in fact <laughs> Dirac's original argument. This thing is effectively a Dirac string. Dirac string was, was of this form. Okay, well that is all I prepared. I thought it was much more than one lecture, but um, I, let me say if there are any, are there any questions? Uh, is, and oh, first of all, do I owe anybody? I have two candies left. Do I owe anybody a candy? Awesome. All right. Did you have a question? I was wondering, so is is there really uh, no other way to? Uh, I mean, no other. No interference pattern you can look for. There's really no way to detect this. Um, you mean the solenoid? Yeah. Oh, sure. You'd use something of a different charge. If you had quark beams, um, and you'd have fractional okay. charge. Yeah. But of course, the quarks are confined, so you're stuck. <coughs> well, what about a uh, fractional quantum Hall system? Fractional, fractional quantum ball effect or something? Yeah, could you use that to... I, 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 how would you send? I don't know enough about what, that to... to, to <laughs> what about if you just take... A, charge, like, you just take chunks of, chunks of electrons. Some, some other charged particle that's larger. Pass the system. That's like, that has two charges per each one. Oh, no, that doesn't help. Oh, uh, it's still, it's still it's in. Okay. Right, you need, you need a fraction of the charge. Yeah. Or some non-whole yeah. integer of a charge. Yeah. Let me just mention um, so, something uh, that just occurred to me. That, uh, as we'll see on Wednesday, um, you can have a non abelian gauge theory in which a magnetic monopole occurs in a sort of natural way as a kind of solid. <coughs> and um, so, in fact, one can say that in 
a certain class of non abelian engaged theories, you do expect solitons to occur. So the question is, where are they? Because people have looked and haven't seen any, uh, except once they saw one at Stanford. But um, it's this guy on the street. Uh, but it was in a hurry. <laughs> it was what? It was in a hurry, so the, the soliton was in a hurry. The soliton was in a hurry. Anyway, um, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it, it may have been a graduate student prank. Um, <laughs> or a mistake, or I don't know, there's some fluctuation. Anyway, the idea, so where are all the magnetic monopoles? The idea is that in the early universe, um, there were some magnetic monopoles created in the very early universe, but then inflation occurred. And so because of inflation, they were spread out in space so much that um, they're very rare. And, uh, so that's, that's the party line. Yeah. 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 You guys um, do, I, I, I did mention to you, I, mean, I assume you, you went to the colloquium not only Friday, but the, a, a week ago, the Chinese guy. Yeah. All right, well, let me tell you, let me tell you the bottom line from that quote. Like that. It was a marvel. All right, I'll just tell it again because it bears repeating. The, um, he was working on the evolution of the elements in stars. And we know what the distribution of the 92 elements is, or of, in fact, the radioactive ones also. And um, the yeah, radioactive isotopes. And uh, he, um, has worked out uh, that there are two ways in which the elements are created, both involve neutrinos. One is a fast <coughs> process, the other is a slow process. The slow, the fast and slow process, will, in particular, the slow process is sensitive to whether the neutrinos, you know, there are two mass eigen, three mass eigenstates, and normally one thinks of them like this, that the two that are close together are light, but there's also the possibility that the two that are close together, the two mass eigenstates that are close together are heavy. He says, in fact, and this is called an inverted hierarchy. Um, he says, in fact, this is what you need to account for the slow evolution of the element, uh, the slow generation of the elements. And um, it's really amusing because everybody thought this was the right answer. And they just mentioned this in order to be politically correct. And they'd mention it and then ignore it. And they always go back to this. Apparently this is the right answer. So it's a it's the first really significant uh, result on neutrino physics in maybe twenty years. I mean the other there have been a lot of significant results, but I mean, really significant as opposed to just, you know, a slight improvement in the you know, delta m squared. You see, the problem is that in the neutrino experiment, the, uh, the interference patterns are only sensitive to the absolute value of the differences of the masses, rather than the, uh, rather than the differences themselves. So it's always, people write it as delta m squared. All right, well, let's turn it off. I, Thank you.